Welcome to a quick start seminar series. Um, my name is Mike Tischer. I'm your host. Uh, for those of me, for those, for those of you who don't know me, I am a trip leader and a senior instructor with a Colorado Mountain Club, and I'm hosting these quick start seminars now uh, since uh, March, I think, March or April, and we're having one every month. Um, and uh, for November, I'm very excited to have Ryan and Rachel here, who talk about National Geographic the Trails Illustrated maps, what else is available, how those maps are being made, and how to best use them when you're in the field of for trip planning. So I'm very excited about this. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a couple of months now, and I'm so um, excited that we'll finally uh, have them here, and um, they will tell us all the secrets that we ever wanted to know about National Geographic. So, um, But before that, I want to briefly mention that uh, we have a couple of seminars coming up. Um, we're closing out the lovely year of 2020. I'm sure everybody's happy about that. It's coming to a close with uh, the ski touring um, webinar uh, by Alan Apt. And um, he just released a book with Kay Tombaugh that's available through the CMC Press. And he will tell us all about um, backcountry skiing. Um, that book has been released now for one or two months. We had, I think, a, a release talk by him a couple of months ago. So if you missed that one, now is your chance in December, on December 7th, to uh, learn about that if you're interested in backcountry skiing, that is. And then for next year, we're doing, we're changing the QSS format a little bit. Uh, many of you know we had two series parallel going on. We had... Uh, um, the navigation and trip planning series that I'm hosting. And then Cindy Lair was hosting a general quick start seminar series. Um, and we're putting those two together for next year and alternate them. And uh, I'm very excited that Anna Liao has uh, volunteered and is ready to join me uh, next year to host those seminars. So she will be responsible for the general topic seminars and I will be responsible still for the navigation and trip planning seminars. And the first one that's coming up in January is uh, outdoor gear, how to find your the best deals. And that's done, or that's uh, that talk is given by Sarah Thompson. Uh, many of you know Sarah, she's very active in the club and she was uh, also a uh, in retail. So she knows all the tips and tricks of how to get the, the best deals. So that will be in January. We're still working on the date, but it's probably going to be somewhere mid-January. So, you know, if you have some Christmas money left, that might be the um, the webinar you want to um, join to see um, what's, uh, what's good to get, what's a good bargain. And then on February 22nd, uh, we're going to talk to uh, somebody from Open Summit. Um, it's going to be Joel Kratz, who is the CEO and the founding meteorologist for Open Summit and Open Snow. And for those of you who don't know those two websites, those are two websites that deal with mountain weather forecast and snow forecasts in Colorado and beyond. Um, they have apps too for, uh, for phones and iPads. Um, and so he's gonna tell us all about his website and how they do the forecasting and how you can use it to uh, um, do the trip planning and do some navigation while you're in the field. So that's gonna be a cool one too. And they're a Boulder company. So it's nice to have something local come in and tell us all about this. Um, okay, without further ado, um, I wanna introduce Ryan and Rachel. Ryan is a sales manager for National Geographic and Rachel is a senior cartographer. And I'll have to thank them very much for doing this because what I did, I basically just wrote them an email saying, hey, we're doing this, do you wanna be part of this? And they're like, oh, that sounds like fun, let's do it. So it took us a few months to plan this, um, but now they're both here and um, they have lots of information for you um, that hopefully is, is gonna be useful. And um, if you have any questions as uh, usually with these webinars, please put them in the chat and we either answer them during the presentation and we of course will have a, a question and answer session at the end for you guys to answer all the questions that uh, you're that are on your mind. So without further ado, um, I think we're gonna start with Ryan and he's gonna share his screen and we get going. Thanks awesome. guys. Let me get this shared for you here.
Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so I'm one of the sales managers here at National Geographic and uh, well, and thanks for having us. We're excited to be here and I'm excited to run through um, a little bit more about us. And, you know, one of the things a lot of people don't really know about the maps division of National Geographic is that we're actually a Colorado company. So, you know, National Geographic was founded uh, in 1915 in Washington, D.C. Um, and at that time, we were kind of um, a service industry to the magazine. We were, the maps division was actually the first division um, of the magazine. So we have some, some, some pretty, um, you know, rooted history within National Geographic. Um, but in 1997, we ended up purchasing Trails Illustrated. Uh, and that's where kind of our, our retail um, and consumer products were born. And, and that's where, when we started becoming more of a, uh, a, um, a consumer company. So that was, you know, when we did that, then we moved the majority of our map staff to Evergreen. We still kept a handful of our cartographers um, to service the magazine and the channel and, and um, different, different areas there. But in terms of the retail business, we took over the same offices just right up there on Floyd Hill um, off of I-70 and have, have been there uh, since, uh, since 1997. So it's kind of a cool thing that a lot of people don't realize about those maps um, and about our company is that we are here in Colorado. Um, all of our maps are printed here in Colorado as well. So that goes for any of our folded products, whether it be trail maps, adventure maps, um, you know, you name it. If it's a if it's a paper product and and it's uh, it's printed here in Colorado, so definitely a, a pretty cool, unique thing too that we're really proud of that we can be here in the state and uh, and be doing this here. Um, and then you know the other thing I think I just wanted to touch on as I kind of just went through a little bit about you know who we are is just another thing a lot of people don't know we don't advertise it much, um, but we do return twenty seven percent of our sales you know, both in, in terms of the map, you know, all of our sales, but also licensing. So any of the licensing deals we have, everything um, of that goes back to uh, National Geographic Society. So um, it's definitely a, you know, that's a big, big chunk and something that we're proud of. And we probably don't, we probably don't advertise that enough, but I thought it was worth bringing up here. Um, but what I wanted to do today, too, is just, you know, as my part of it, you'll hear from Rachel and she'll go through the really interesting stuff that I'm sure you guys want to hear about, you know, how maps are made and, and a lot about her job. But I did want to talk to you guys a little bit about kind of um, the different types of maps, what we're doing now with maps. You guys, I'm sure, are very familiar with, you know, our kind of standard Trails Illustrated maps that you can see on the screen now, those kind of two-sided folded products. Um, and, you know, those have kind of been the bread and butter of what we've done since, since we started. Um, and they're still a really big part of what we do. And, and uh, we're still constantly revising them. We're constantly, you know, finding new ways. And this is what Rachel's, Rachel's doing to, um, you know, make those as useful as possible for people when they're out, out in the, in the back country or, or wherever they're going. Um, and so I, with that though, we have tried to find ways to kind of innovate a paper map as much as you know you you can innovate that. You know, it's it's something we've been really focused on and we've done a really good job with in in the past, you know, five, six years, we've really come out with a lot of new formats in in, in the way that we map. And you know, this was for a handful of different reasons. Um, but as you know, a lot of us are seeing by how busy the trailheads are and, and how hard it is sometimes to get out to the mountains. You know, more and more people are getting outside, which is an awesome thing. Um, and for a lot of people, they do know how to use a map. But, you know, a lot of these new users, it's very foreign to them. And so we're trying to find ways um, to help maps be uh, not so scary. You know, I think a lot of times people are just intimidated by by maps. And so... We have a lot of new formats that we came out with um, and new products. And so I'm gonna run through a few of those and I'll walk you through one specific so you can you can actually kind of see the things I'm talking about right now. But, um, you know, the first thing we started doing was 
uh, with these topographic guides, their booklet format, their topographic. And so you can see those, like all of these here, Rocky Mountain day hikes, the river maps, uh, backpack loops, 14ers. We started doing long distance trails. Those are all in booklet format. And so it allows us one to create more editorial in the front of the product. So we can talk a little bit more um, about, you know, whatever it may be that, that um, fills the need for that product. And so, you know, when you're talking about like our river maps, um, you're gonna have a lot of information about the biology of the river. We include hatch charts, um, you know, all the put-ins and takeouts and what facilities are available at all of those. And then of course, you know, all of our leave no trace and, and you know, helping people understand how to recreate responsibly. So they become almost a mix of a guidebook and a topographic map. And so, you know, it's, it's a really cool thing and, and they're really useful for people to, that want to be told kind of where to go and what to do. Um, and so as you kind of, as we moved through this series, you know, we started doing 14ers, Colorado backpacking loops. Um, both of those are similar where, um, you know, we, in those we're able to provide directions to trailheads. You know, we recommend specific backpacking loops with descriptions um, and elevation profiles, mileages, and it really helps people who kind of don't even know where to begin. It gives them a kind of a launching point. Um, and then kind of in that, in that same area, one of the, some of the feedback we get a lot of times with our Trails Illustrated products is that, um, you know, a, a, a visitor's coming from another state and they're staying in, in Winter Park and they, you know, they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. And majority of our trail maps, we don't focus on the town. We're focused on the back country. We want to get you guys out in the back country and make sure you guys know where you are when you're when you're out there and so these are kind of focusing more on the towns themselves and what people can get to really quickly from where they're staying um, it also has a lot more detail when it comes to the actual resort itself in you know in recent years more and we're seeing more and more bike trails and and you know trails within the actual um, the resort boundaries and so we worked closely with those resorts to create these products um, so one side of it will be um, focused in on that resort and on that town. And then the other side will feature um, five to six hikes uh, ranging in difficulty level um, that will give them directions to the trailhead. And then we'll have a map uh, inset of that specific trail. So it, um, you know, it's, it's really, we're trying to cater to a much broader group as a much broader group is, is getting outside. So I'm going to walk you through our newest series, which is Rocky Mountain Day Hikes, just to kind of put into perspective some of those things I just talked about. Um, and so with this product, it's going to be very similar to the backpacking loops, to the 14ers, to a lot of those in terms of um, the format of the map. So you can, when you open the product, it's going to go um, straight to this front page that kind of shows you a, a a large area of what we're covering and then what the day hikes are that we're going to be featuring within this product. It'll break them down so you can kind of see a quick view of what each the name of each one. Um, but in order for you to get more detail to kind of choose which hike is, is for you, um, we have here a list of all of them and then descriptions for each. And then including, included in that, you're going to see the total mileage, the total elevation gain, and then also a difficulty level. Um, and so this is really useful for people when they're in a new area and they kind of just, they don't even know where to begin. And then as you go through, we're gonna have a little bit more of that editorial I was talking about. And obviously each map is gonna differ depending on kind of what the needs are of that area. Obviously in the national park, we need to have a lot of education on, on how to safely view wildlife, um, you know, how to safely hike around a waterfall and, you know, where you can get drinking water, the weather, the different things like that. So we have a lot of health and safety information in these, in these as well as survival tips. Um, and then as you go on, you're gonna get into the actual content of what these maps look like and what the content is. So in these, you know, each one of those trails that we recommend in the beginning is gonna have a full page of the topographic map. You're gonna see that elevation profile um, down below there. And then also one of the real big game changers for a lot of these is just the directions to the trailhead. Um, 
it's it's one of those things I think at least the shop owners and, and me being a sales guy and, and talking to all of my customers, you know, they don't have to write write directions on the back of receipts anymore. Um, it's all right here for them. Um, and so those are kind of a little bit, you know, kind of giving you an idea of just where we're going with our map products. And, you know, Rachel will, will get into the more in depth. Um, but, you know, the other thing we get asked a lot about, obviously, is digital. Um, and that's something we don't have our own app. And we really don't have a plan to have our own app. Uh, and right now we, we have picked a, a few partners that are, are great companies um, and have been great partners to us that we license our data to. And so those being Gaia GPS, Avenza, um, Topo Maps Plus. And, uh, you know, all these partners offer a little bit something different. When you're talking about Gaia, that's going to be a subscription service. Same with Topo Maps Plus. Um, and then Avenza is you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, you're gonna purchase those maps a la carte. With the Venza though, you're not just getting our trail products. You, you do have the ability to get a lot of our reference products. Um, and, you know, a lot of those historical maps, the travel maps, a lot of that information um, in, in that one there too. So you can kind of pick what's best for you, but all of these are great products. So, um, you know, that's just a little background about kind of, you know, our history, what we're currently doing now. Um, and then one other thing I didn't touch on that I should have in terms of the Colorado thing is we, we print all of our maps here in Colorado as well. And so, um, you know, from the design and cartography to the printing, to the warehouse, to the shipping, it, you know, if you see a map on the shelf in REI here in Colorado, it, it's never left the state. And so, so it's just, again, one of those things we're really proud of that we're able to keep everything really local. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, should be a source of pride for you guys too when you're using it to, uh, to know that it's a fully Colorado product. Um, so what I'm gonna do too is I'm gonna pass it over now to Rachel though, and she can actually walk through um, a little, go into a little bit more depth with a lot of this stuff. All right, hi everybody. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, let me move this over. Um, hi, uh, yeah, so I'm Rachel and as Ryan and Mike mentioned, I'm a cartographer with National Geographic. I actually started working for them over a decade ago. I started interning for them in college. If you remember the Topo software, I started working for them right before we kind of discontinued that. Um, so that was like 12 years ago already. So, but I've been in Evergreen since 2010 as a cartographer. And I have, uh, people always ask like, how did I get into cartography? Well. I went, I have a degree in geography with a concentration in GIS from Appalachian State University. And, you know, I've always loved science and the outdoors. And so when I went into my first geography class, it was just kind of like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then when I had my first cartography class, it just clicked because I've also always been really artistic. And so to me, cartography is the perfect combination of art and science. You have the ability to take the objective reality of the world around us and turn it into something that people can easily understand, become inspired by, and gain information from. So I think, you know, it's just, it's been fun working on maps my whole career, and I hope um, it's good to, I think people really love maps too, so that's exciting. And so it, I'll kind of get into what I'm talking tonight about, but I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of making maps at Trails Illustrated, how we make them today, and then how I use them to recreate personally. So before I get into the history of Trails Illustrated mapping, I'm gonna do this really quickly <laughs> and, and bear with me now, but I think it's really interesting. In order to understand the, how we make maps at Trails Illustrated, I want you to understand how the USGS started mapping the country. So the United States Geological Survey. 
because those seven and a half minute quadrangle maps that I think we all know about have always served as the base map of a Trails Illustrated map. So what happened was in the late 1800s, John Wesley Powell, who was the icon to us geographers, at this point, he was the second director of the USGS. So he convinced Congress for them to map out the country in a systematic way. So this is where those USGS maps started coming from. And Powell became famous from that. Uh, he took an expedition down the Colorado River. He had like a crew of nine men in the 1860s and was one of the first people to explore and map the Colorado River. So here, this is um, a map of Kaibab, Arizona. So if you see in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see triangulation and topography by the Powell survey. So this, this map is coming from, the edition says 1886. So this was a little bit after he took that first famous trip, but I think he took a couple trips back. But I think it's really cool that we have these maps of the original Powell survey. So he was, literally the guy mapping out the country. So the way these maps were made is it was using 19th century surveying techniques. I'm trying to keep it simple, but they would measure a bunch of points. They would take compass bearings. They would measure the elevation of points by the barometric pressure. Um, and then they would actually hand sketch terrain in the field. So, in Colorado, which is cool, so if you go to a lot of the historic Colorado topographic maps, uh, this was done by the Hayden survey. I'm going to mispronounce his name, but Ferdinand and Hayden. So he was another really awesome geographer, and he, he did the Hayden survey. So this is an image from the Hayden survey. This is Pikes Peak. And so this would be, and this is around the same time, so the 1870s. So here's a map of Telluride in 1897. So this, like I said, was surveyed by the Hayden survey. And um, like I said, they were drawn in the field and a lot of the data was collected in the field. And to reproduce these maps, they would, they would have the drawings in the field and then they would go and ha have them engraved onto copper plates. And then it was ran through a printing press. At this point, there was only three colors used. So they would have a blue layer for the hydro features, a black layer for the roads and the transport, uh, transportation and the feature names, and then a brown color for the contours. So I just want you to remember that concept of printing on layers because it really is the foundation of map making. And it's really, it's basically how you can print things efficiently, reproduce an image. So here's Leadville in 1889, again, this was, uh, done in the Hayden survey. And you can really see the three colors here, like the really cool bathymetry on Twin Lakes, that blue. You can see the brown contour lines and that black color for the roads and the, and the feature names. So this is how maps were pretty much made until the 20th century. So here we have an image of those, that classic seven and a half minute quadrangle that I learned how to navigate in the field on, um, in the backcountry on. And I think so many of us trust today as just a really solid source of the terrain out there. So this is really what happened is as any technological advances in our, our world, the military started to pave way for the next advancement in map making, which really began with aerial photography. Technically, it's like photogrammetry, photomechanical map making, but it even started in the Civil War, they would go up in hot air balloons and take photographs of, of the enemy territory. And that was kind of like this concept of aerial photography used, used for maps. So some stuff was learned in World War I as well as World War II, but the uh, technology was really starting to be implemented after World War II. And then at that point, there is a need to map out the country in a really detailed way, and there is more resources thrown into it. So the technology advanced, so you're using more photograph technology to make maps. So if you see here, and this, 
corner here, we can see topography from aerial photographs by photogrammetric methods. The aerial photographs were taken in 1953 and field checked in 1957. So they're moving away from printing on copper plates and now using the technology of film-based reproduction. And they were even taking pictures of those pen and ink drawings and turning them into a layer of film to reproduce that way. I'm trying to, I'm going to try and simply explain how they would create um, contour lines from an, imi an image, but it was, it's called a stereo model, a stereo plotter, and you would compare two images to determine the elevation, and then they were able to draw contours. So at this point, there's, when you're moving into photo reproduction, now there's five colors used. So you can see it. We have black for county boundaries, political roads, feature names, blue for the hydro features. We have a green color for the vegetation. And red, we have red for there's some road stuff and also some ownerships in red. So, once it, they moved away from drawing in pen and ink and moved to what we call scribing, which is you're literally taking a, another piece of film negative and tracing out line features onto this film negative to add to a layer to the map. So really tedious. At, it, some consider this the height of art in cartography because you're you know, you have to have some real skill and draw out a feature. Now you can use measure, you can take measurements and get precise with it, but it's still, you're drawing something out onto film and they would have like a, a thin layer on top and you would scrape that off, just like this image to the right, they call it peel coat. So you scrape off the feature, this is a, they're making a geological map and that would get printed as a layer on the map. You could also, I would Google Leroy lettering. It, se it seems very satisfying for me to do, but it, it's very slow. You like literally using like this little tool to perfectly write out each letter. It's like calligraphy, a, a manual way to make perfect calligraphy. So that's how they were made from the, the USGS topo maps were pretty much mapped that way kind of in the 40s until 1991 is when they finished mapping the whole country with that 24K seven and a half minute quadrangle. So the scale would be one to 24,000. And so it took, you know, half a century to map out the country, but yeah, they were doing it until the 90s. Now everything is GIS driven. So now all those maps that, um, I think we, a lot of people still used to navigate with, they're considered historical topographic maps. And I think in like 2009, 2010, the USGS went completely digital. So now they make a product called US Topo and it's just a bunch, it's driven by GIS data. It's a completely digital product. It's nice because it can be updated all the time. Um, but I think there was something so beautiful about those old maps. So that's sad to see them go, but I understand because they're very hard to maintain. So this image on the left, going back to layers, is kind of the concept of GIS. And, you know, every feature on the map can be stacked on top of each other to form one cohesive map. With GIS, all of these layers are packed with information and it allows the cartographer to look at a computer and see, look at a transportation layer and see what a road name is. It can see even, you can, sometimes there's even speed limits in road data. It can see the class of the road. Uh, and it can look at like the hydro features and it can see if it's a perennial stream, is it a, intermittent stream, we have a layer for all the feature names, we have an elevation layer, we have political boundary layer. So this is how maps are made today with the USGS and with us, it's all digital.
Of course, I forgot to press play on my thing, so I gotta keep track of my time here. Okay, here we go, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so more into the history now of making Trails Illustrated maps. So Ryan briefly touched on the history. I'm gonna go a little more in depth about it, just because it is, is and always has been a Colorado company. It started with a woman in Conifer, in the Conifer area making these maps in the 70s. And then it was bought by a couple who lived in Evergreen. And so they were on Floyd Hill. And then once National Geographic bought it from that couple who was on Floyd Hill, they were still uh, in the company and they uh, worked there for a few years. But then the, it, the company started to grow a little bit. And so they built another house right next to their house. So those are the two houses we're still in today. Um, you know, I haven't been there in nine months, but uh, just letting you know, we're all, we, we've been in Colorado pretty much the whole, well, the whole time of Trails Illustrated has always been in Colorado. But so in the seventies, this image, this is a, our 108 map of Vail Pass. We were using the same technique as the USGS. So we'll go back to here, this photomechanical map production, where you're taking film separations and making a map out of them. So it was photomechanical map making. Then in the 90s, the uh, Trails Illustrated hired its first, this was before it was bought by Nat Geo, um, they hired their first digital cartographers and we made a hybrid product. So we were still using those USGS film separations, but we started to use a desktop software. I think we were using freehand, but I could be wrong. So we were using a desktop software to add on a layer of recreation. It's funny because they would make this new layer, so they would, and I'll get into this in a second, but you would take a picture, uh, you would have an image of the map, we would scan that into a computer, and then we would digitize the trails and the points of interest on top of that image using a graphic software, and then that graphics, that graphic software vector layer would be sent to the printer, the printer would turn that into a film negative and, and put that on top of the other negatives to form an image. So it was a hybrid product. Um, and then in 2000, we, we made our first fully digital product. It was Olympic National Park. So it was a fully digital CMYK map. I can talk about that in a little bit too more. So, why I talked about the USGS maps is what we did is we essentially stitched these four maps together to make one map side. So on the left here, we have four seven and a half minute quadrangles. And what, what we do is you would order film separations from the USGS for each of these maps. So you'd order, you say, I want the contours and I want the hydro features and I want the physical name features. You'd order a complete film separation for each of those quadrangles, they get mailed to you. And then, then we would stitch them together literally with tape, put, putting these four pieces of tape to stitch the four quadrangles together and create another image. So our Colorado maps, got started by just this concept. So if you know our maps well, some of the, the scale is, is rather random. We have a scale of 1 to 40, 680, which doesn't really make sense. But what happened was you find, so the printer or the cartographer knows that you can print a map on a certain page size. So, but I know I want to stitch these four maps together. So I need to reduce that image to fit on this page size. And this is something we deal with all the time is we want, we're limited to the paper size we can print on. But we also want to give you the best scale and the best overview of the map. So this scale of 4680 was figured out as the best way to fit those four seven and a half minute quadrangles on one map size. So that's the history behind that. 
It's also why a lot of our map boundaries in Colorado are kind of random. Like sometimes a really awesome point of a, a, a nice trail, a really good loop trail is cut literally in half and one of it is on one title and the other is on the other. It's because we were mapping the maps out based on where the um, USGS quads were. So they're, they're every seven and a half minutes in longitude. So that's just what we kept them at and we still keep them at that today. That's why we make a lot of other products besides our, we call them our 100 series. Those are our Colorado titles. Um, just to give someone a benefit of having a better overview map. But that's kind of how that map got started is it was literally just stitching the four USGS quadrangles together. What's even crazier is to scale the map because they would come at one to 24,000, but we, like I said, you wanted to get to fit onto this page size. So what would happen is you would order these film separations from the USGS. Then you would send it to someone who, it's called a copy camera. So this is a map, photo mechanical map production technique where it's a huge camera in a room and you can measure the scale of where you want to take the picture. So if you know you want it this scale, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to take it 70% away from the picture. And that's how you would rescale a map at that point. So in the 70s, this woman in Conifer, Conifer area would order the photo separations for each USGS quadrangle, send them out to a copy camera to reduce to that 4080 scale. They would get sent back to her. She would tape them together with tape to form one image. Then you get this new image and then drafters would take a new piece of film, lay it on top of there and scribe in the recreational content like the trails and the points of interest. So it was very time consuming. It was very expensive too, because film was very expensive. So this is uh, actually map 130, the Salida map in Colorado. So this is one side. And here's the other side of the map. So it's eight, seven and a half minute quadrangles stitched together. So yeah, like I said, there's limitations. Like for one uh, map like this, I think, I'm not, I don't think this would, is cost 15 grand because I think you would need more, but one map with more quadrangles could cost up to 15 grand just to buy the film separations. And you're also, have some limitations because you're taking a picture of this type from the USGS. So if you try and scale it down too small to make a, a what we call a smaller scale map, um, the text can get blurry and it's hard to read. You're also limited to just the colors that the USGS is making their maps on because they would send you a film negative and it would be a blue film negative. You would in, in a, a blue and a brown and a red layer, kind of like the layers I talked about before. So this is actually a hybrid map, what I'm showing you. It's hard to find, especially since I can't, we're, we're discouraged from going into the office right now. So uh, we have a bunch of these film separations stacked up in our office, um, but I, we do have some scanned images of the hybrid maps. And this is what this uh, 730 map is. So this map was made with that original photomechanical process with the USGS film negatives and then these uh, black points of interest and trails, that was done digitally as a digital layer. I did find an image of the Vail map. This is Vail Pass map, I think it's 108. So this is that, this is really, you're just taking the film separations from the USGS and adding, I think like two elk trail was added and a couple trailheads were added. So this is from the 80s. So we were essentially just taking the USGS film separations and, and scaling them down to make a better overview map for people to use. Okay, so here I'm zoomed into the southern part of the Sawatch Range near Salida. This is map 130. So now we're looking at a USGS topographic quad. This is actually four stitched together, but you can see right here, this is the grid line. Um, 
the, this is where they're stitched together, it's, hence the double pieces of type. And I'm just going to show you that this is a hybrid map of what I just showed you, that it's, it's the same type. It's the same hydro features. None of that type was moved around, but there is some uh, a layer added with recreation content. And so this was done digital in that one digital layer because it was a hybrid map. But this is what used to be scribed in by hand on a film negative to add to this back, this base map that was film negatives as well. So we have recreation content like trails and notes that are used are, are good for the user. This is the map today. So this is the full digital map. There's an interesting story about Mount Chavado. I don't know if y'all, there is, if you look at this old map. So it shows, this is private land. It shows that the peak is not on private land, but technically it is on private land. I don't know if y'all know any of that. I think it's currently under trying to get purchased by the 14ers initiative. But so everybody used to think that it wasn't private and it was like, no, it's private. And then that's reflected in our map today. Um, like I said, I think it's being purchased for public use. So here's uh, the USGS quadrangle out of Ta Taos, New Mexico. This is our map 730. So I'm just kind of showing you how the hybrid map is, is the same USGS base with the recreation content added. Here's the map today. The scale is different. We actually changed the scale of this map to include more overview. So yeah, like I mentioned, um, Olympic National Park was our first fully digital CMYK map. It came out, this was the, the, this version was, came out in 2000. Um, digital, obviously there's lots of benefits to it. We don't have any more film separations. And CMYK, it's, it's, that's just what things are printed at. It's more efficient to print at CMYK. You can get more colors in CMYK. But the same concept of everything's in layers. So now we just send the printer an image, but there's a layer of cyan, there's a layer of magenta, there's a layer of yellow, and there's a layer of black. So K is black. So these layers are being printed on top of each other. Really, it's just you have to think about it. What's the most efficient way to reproduce an image? Because we want to, you know, everybody wants a map. So how are we going to reproduce this map that's made? Okay, so making maps today. Everything is GIS driven. Um, the, you know, it started with aerial photography, but then satellites came about and just the, the technology for digital maps just exploded. Um, now we're 100% digital, like I said. We use GIS data with a combination of desktop software. We use Adobe Illustrator. Photoshop, we use a GIS software, we actually we use ArcGIS. We also use an awesome plugin for Adobe Illustrator, which is called a Venza Map Publisher, which is a GIS plugin for Illustrator. We automate a lot of our processes. So instead of having to painstakingly place each letter, um, we can label things automatically. There's a lot of tedious processes too that we use like Apple scripts just to automate so we don't have to do the same thing over and over and over again. So now we're looking at raw GIS data. So this is in Canyonlands National Park. Um, this is actually, this is the confluence when the green meets the Colorado. And this is just a bunch of GIS data. We're using publicly available GIS data. Most of it is coming from the USGS. Uh, there, it's, it's vector and raster data packed with information. Like I kind of touched on with the GIS, how we have these lines and points that are packed with feature names and feature classes and the DEM. I'll get into that in a second, but that's, that has elevation data. We also have a set of graphics styles that we can apply to these maps. 
uh, to kind of automate the process too. So we'll select all of the perennial streams and give it a graphic style. We'll select all of the primary roads and give it a bold red style. So now I'm just overlaying the data on a USGS topographic map, that, that seven and a half minute quadrangle. I want like what's interesting is a lot of the GIS data we use today came from the topographic maps. They were it was digitized from these maps, especially the feature names, even the hydro. Uh, some of the contours are used to make um, contours are digitized to make DEMs, which a DEM is a digital elevation model, and I'll get into that right now because. Key component for our maps, this is where our shaded relief comes from. So a DEM, it's a raster image. It's essentially a grid of pixels and each pixel contains an elevation value. So this is made from a variety of resources. What I just mentioned is some of it is just made from the old USGS contours. It's, it's made into a raster images. Now it can be made from a satellite image. Um, there's the invention of LIDAR, which is huge, which is um, it's laser technology where it sends a laser down and it shoots a, back, a point back up so you can take extremely detailed elevation. That's kind of where the country is moving now to mapping uh, elevation. So this is the national land cover data set. This is at, on USGS product too. We use it for our vegetation cover. Again, a raster, a bunch of pixels with a cone. This green is the vegetation. So we use that data to make our shaded relief. So here's our shaded relief layer. Of course, I picked an area with no vegetation. It's in Canyonlands National Park, but you can kind of see the green right there. So we'll add some contours from that DEM. That's how we produce contours. We, we use a, a software where I kind of just click a button, but it's coming from that DEM, as well as our health shade. So then we'll add our hydro feature. So this is coming from a USGS project as well. It's called the National Hydro Hydrography Data Set. So we'll add our hydro layer and our we have springs, feature names, rapids. So then we'll add our feature, more feature names, physical feature names and elevations. This is coming from a data set called GNIS, Geographic uh, I just, my mind went blank, names, and for, uh, my mind went blank, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, it's essentially a digital version of all the place names in the U.S. coming from these USGS seven and a half minute quadrangles. So somebody back in the day went through those maps, added a point, said, this is the dollhouse. And now we have those points to use today to name features. Our elevations actually all come from the USGS topographic maps, this is something uh, that we may, uh, it's, we're now a lot of what you see, I think on the US topos too, is they're derived from a DEM. We're still continuing to match them to the seven and a half minute quadrangles. So that's where our elevations are coming from. Then we add in an ownership boundary. So we have county boundaries and national park boundaries. This is coming from a wide variety of data sets, all publicly available, all government agencies, BLM, uh, the BLM data set. We have a county data set, which comes from the Census Bureau. Then we'll add in our road layer. So our road layer, we like to get roads from the agency we're working with. So this is a national park. So we'll try and get any road data that they have because it's usually the best available. And then outside of the park or the forest, we'll use, uh, we usually use tiger line data, which is from the US Census Bureau. Then we'll add in trails. So like, just like the roads, we'll try and get them from the national park or the forest service or wherever we're working. Um, if we can't find any trail data, uh, imagery is a great source. We'll digitize it from imagery. Um, well, sometimes if you can't see anything, imagery is wonderful to work out in West because you can see, um, but in more wooded areas like the Southeast or the Northeast, you can't really use the imagery to digitize trails. So if you don't have trail data, you, we rely on trail descriptions and just using the terrain to kind of figure out where the trail is. That's our last resort. 
but we try and use data available. So here's like the meaty layer. Um, this is all of our points of interest and extras, as I like to call them. So this is when we're using GIS data to get us to step one, but step two is a lot of research involved by the cartographer. So if you can see down here, uh, I have a GIS point where I know there's a trailhead at Elephant Hill, but then the cartographer will go and research like, well, what other amenities are on at Elephant Hill? Okay, there's a picnic area, there's a restroom. This is also where you start to notice like different discrep discrepancies in the map and you'll able to confirm that from imagery or online research. Uh, we'll add trail images in, which we generate with our software. We add in, we just started to add it in generated elevations. So that's why these are gray and the non-generated elevations coming from the seven and a half minute quadrangles are black. Our generated elevations are gonna be rounded too. So you have a map and then we put it together. We add a cover and we add some, what we call map tech, some information about the place, a legend. So quality control. So how do I make sure this is the most accurate map ever? Is it goes through multiple uh, rounds of edit from our cartographic editor. So think about it, we have, we start out with a base layer. So that's our hydro features and our transportation features. And that goes through an edit. And then all the recreation content goes through an edit. After it's been through an edit, we meet with local agencies. We send the National Park US Forest Service copies of the map and they mark it up and they send it back to us. Sometimes we go out there to meet with them and discuss it and sit there and pour over the map and they tell us what's right and what's wrong. We also meet with local experts for the Pacific Crest Trail. We worked with half mile data. Um, for the Colorado for Teeners, we worked with a guidebook author. For the Colorado Trail, we worked with the Colorado Foundation, Trail Foundation. And then we always love customer feedback. So if you ever find anything wrong on our map, please email mapsinfo at nachiomaps.com. We will get to it. And the next time we update that map, uh, we will send you a new copy. We also try and keep things low print run. So if there is a major mistake on our map, we can correct it and then print it pretty quickly. We try and revise our maps every three to five years, but realistically, it's like every five to 10 years. Um, you know, we have a lot of titles and that is a challenge and people, you know, we're, we're working on that. But in reality, you know, things change, but things don't change that much. And you gotta figure you're using our map for the terrain and kind of access points and it's up to the user to kind of research that as well. So here's just an image of our edit that's been through our map, that, that map that I showed you that's been through an edit process. So everything in yellow has been cleared off. These points, these triangles, these circles are all digital edits from our cartographic editor that we can keep in this file. And now I'm gonna kind of run through this last part. Like Ryan said, we can take one map and go to multiple products. So there's that uh, Mount Shivano in the south of the Sawatch range. We'll take that, we'll turn it into a 14ers product. You can add information pertinent to that map product. The, I'm circling the purple 14,000 foot contour line. So we have this 14ers map on the left and the Colorado Trail on the right, all coming from that same base Trail Illustrated map. So how I use Trails Illustrated Maps to plan and then I speed through this, um, I think what's really important is our maps are just, to me, and I may be a little bit biased, but I think they're really easy to read. I can really see where the recreation is based on the bold colors and the black symbols. The ownership is huge. So when I, when I look at the ownership, we, we put our private land in this brown fill and everything else, is not private. So I know that I can go anywhere except that brown land. And that's very useful up to where I wanna go. So let's say I wanna go to this Hayden Gulch Trailhead. Well, I know I probably can't go in that area if I wanted to camp there like the night before, but I know I can go in this PLM area because there's no private land tent there. So I think the starkness of our private land makes it a valuable uh, planning tool of where I can go, where I can't go. 
So we also show the roads we're showing are publicly open roads if it's not in private land. So I don't know if I said that right, but especially in the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Land, for USF lands, we're only showing roads open to vehicle use. So what they call the MVUM roads. So that's something I used to plan. Like I love to go um, like the Friday night, leave work and go find a camp, car camping spot Friday night to hit up Hayden Gulch the next morning. So I know that I can probably camp on this road. I can probably camp on this road. I always use imagery when planning. So I use this uh, map to kind of get my bearings and then I'll go onto Google Maps and look at the imagery and kind of spot out if I see any camping areas there, as well as in the US Forest Service lands. We have our long grid and what's useful is because a lot of people have, you know, think our maps aren't the best scale. So use our maps to plan and then you can go get the USGS topo maps for more detail. So we have our lat long grid. We label every seven and a half minutes, which correlates to where the topo, there are the seven and a half minute quadrangles are. We also have these little ticks on our maps. Those ticks are the seven and a half minute quadrangle ticks. So when you see those ticks, You'll see four of them, that's a USGS map quadrangle. So if you're, if you're unsure of something on our map, remember that's not in the map legend, our base is that USGS base. So look at a USGS um, topographic map symbols. So springs and mine features, uh, some type of some elevations, a lot of the elevations symbols. So using maps in the back country, I always navigate with a paper map, always have a paper map. But now there's this thing where I can put a map on my phone and I can see a blue dot and it's like I haven't had to navigate really in forever since I've been doing that. So there's, you know, there's some downside. I think people are, they don't have as great map skills as they used to, but man, is it nice to have a, my phone turn it on and see exactly where I am. So what I do is I like Gaia, I really like the functionality of Gaia GPS. I always download, you're able to download the area of interest before uh, to your phone. So I download the, the map of where I wanna go. I put my phone in airplane mode at home so I know that that map is on my phone without any uh, cell coverage or internet. And then once I get to where I want to go, I immediately put my phone back on airplane mode so it saves battery. Um, and then, yeah, this is from a trip that I did in Lost Creek Wilderness. You can keep tracks and have cool points of interest on there. Um, but Gaia has been really great. You can also, if you have the premium service, you can go um, on their website and have all these map layers that I talked about. So the MVU M rows, the imagery, R layer, you can kind of uh, go through those map layers and it's really helpful for planning. So last thing is how to find these US topos on natgeomaps.com because people don't really know about this. If you go to the main natgeomaps.com page, go to the trail maps tab. And then if you pan down, there's a PDF quads button and you can download all these, the USGS PDF quads. It comes with a lat long grid, a scale, a compass rose. You can also get, so all those maps, the historical maps I was showing you, they're available at a USGS website, Topo View. Thanks guys. I'm like at eight o'clock. Oh, it was so much information, but maybe we can stick around for a few questions. <laughs> Well done, guys. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, right on time, actually. Um, <laughs> we, we, had, we had quite a, a, a few comments in the chat box. Um, one thing that might be worth explaining is or a little bit more the concept of GIS and what it, what it stands for. I mean, it's geographic yeah. information system, but what does this actually mean? Is this a piece of software? Is that a way to work? What do you, you, what, how do you define it? So geographic information systems is really it's the science of looking at all of this data. There is one main company, it's called ArcGIS, but now there's a bunch of offshoots to look at GIS data. So geographic information systems, the best way I would describe it is kind of that, that slide, and I guess I could share my screen again, but it's the concept of looking at all of this data. We call it GIS data. 
because that's what we're using to call those points and lines and vectors that are packed with that information. So the science of GIS is layering that on top of each other to find patterns in the world and to find how our, our environment interacts with each other. You can use GIS for what I just showed you with map making. You can use GIS to see if to map a floodplain. You can use GIS to map disease. My favorite, one of my favorite GIS stories before GIS was even a concept is in like the 1800s, there was, uh, I don't think it was a pandemic, but it was a cholera outbreak in London. And they, a guy named Jon Snow decided to map where the deaths were. So he mapped out all the deaths and then he looked at another layer, which was the water pumps. And he was able to see that the deaths were concentrated around the water pumps. They originally thought that the disease was spread through the air, but looking at our surroundings as a layer, we can see that actually no, the, it's being spread through the water because the deaths were concentrated around the water pumps. That's cool. That, does that help? <laughs> I would hope so. Um, yeah, it's it's so much more than just topography or like a yes. software program. It's like a whole way, almost like a way to work, right? Yes. I mean, how yeah, do you geographic a, information? Yes, it's a field. And um, you like I said, the main software people use is ArcGIS, but there's a free software called QGIS. All of this data I talked about is free. You can go get it. You just... Google GIS shapefile of National Hydro Dataset, and you can download a shapefile, and then you can download QGIS, which is a free software, and add that shapefile into QGIS. Cool. So, uh, folks, if you have other questions, um, put them in the put them in the put them in the chat if you want. Um, one question I wanted wanted to follow up was, um, you know, you have like the BLM lands and the private lands. Is that something that you have to actively monitor or is like the BLM going to come to you and say, hey, we changed this? Or like, for instance, now with a new, um, the new state park that we're getting down at, down at Pueblo, do you actively have to seek out that information or is, the, uh, is Colorado coming to you saying, hey, here's the new polygon for the new state park you, if you want to update your maps? No, we, we seek that out. Okay. So sometimes the park, if our map is like really outdated, they'll, they'll say, okay, you need to update your map. But we don't have the, nobody comes to us and says, hey, look, this needs to be updated. We have to actively search for that. And that's one of the challenges is because we're working with a bunch of different um, data sets. So we work the ownership layer from the BLM. We work the ownership layer from the U.S. Forest Service. And those ownership layers don't match up. So a lot of the tedious work being done for a cartographer is matching those. So if you saw that national park boundary and you saw that private land boundary, most of the time they don't match up. So a cartographer goes in and manually matches it up. So there are some limitations to GIS. It's almost like information overload. You have too much information that you have to go clean up. Cool. Yeah. Same so, with like type. I didn't get really into type placement. Like automating with, with our label programs only gets you so far. Um, and I'm a perfectionist too. And I think that helps in the readability of a map is to make it look really pretty. And the type shouldn't be hard to read. It should flow and it should be easy to read. So a lot of time is spent making type look good too. All right. Cool. So Semi mentioned OpenStreetMap in the in the chat. And I know that's like some community supported geographic information. Are you guys using that? Um, yes, is that the most use, up to date? We use OpenStreetMap data um, for roads. So we've started to actually add the OpenStreetMap data to our map. Um, like, like it is community based. So you can't fully, you can trust it, but then you're trusting the whole community. So you kind of have to go verify it even further. So we really, we like to use government data. Um, we like to use data that we know has some standards, but OpenStreetMap is a great resource. I've been using OpenStreetMap a lot when I can't find a road anywhere or a trail and I see it in OpenStreetMap data and then I verify it through imagery and it's like, okay. So yes, we use OpenStreetMap data. Yeah, it's really cool. Anybody can go on OpenStreetMap and, and, add a, and edit something. And I think a lot of those programs like CalTOPO and Gaia, they use those layers too automatically because they don't have like a, you know, a, a group of geographers who constantly check the trails. <laughs> they have yeah. to pull it from those pu public sources, that information. Yeah. 
Yes, roads, um, roads are the biggest headache. Roads are the biggest headache because there's, they come from a lot of different sources. They're ha it's hard to check every road. Like I wish I could say I check every single road, but you kind of have to use what we call, call cartographic license. So if I see a road that just doesn't make sense, I'll go in and remove that road, but I can't look at every single road. Cool. But yeah, roads are a headache. Yeah, I, I bet. Um, Maya has, uh, has a question. Do you ever pull information from Guthug? No. Guys? Okay. Guthug? Guthub? Guthug. Guthub? Oh, I don't know what it's called. oh Guthug. No, yes. I don't. I don't know what Guthug is. I will look into that, though. I think that has to do with uh, long distance um through hiking, that's right, long distance. Oh, okay. Yeah, so for our long distance trail products, um, we relied on long distance hikers. So like I said, with the PCT maps, we used, we worked with Half Mile and used his data. For the AT, we also used another, his name was Justin, I can't remember his last name, but he was like a professional through hiker and we had him review our maps. Uh, we also just used the AT guidebooks too as a reference. And, and we worked a lot with the associations. Yeah. Like, Who make the guidebooks, right? They make the guidebooks, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's nice that you guys are involved with uh, folks that, you know, maintain those those trails. And, and you get, I didn't know that, that you guys go out to get feedback and, uh, you know, BLM and say, hey, or, or from National Forest, say, and show them the map before you publish them. That's, that's a nice yes, uh, way to that, do a, a quality check, you know? Yes. You know, it... Some people probably, it's, it makes it more, it takes it longer, us longer to make a map. Um, sometimes it takes a while to work with, with government agencies. It can take a while. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's something, it is so important for me to have an accurate map, you know, like that is something, it's so important to me. So the more local eyes we can get on it, the better, because we're, as you saw, we're sitting from a computer manipulating a bunch of data. Uh, so the more local eyes we have on it, the better. Yeah, and one of the interesting things too that we do in terms of compiling a lot of that is like, especially as we do more and more of this curated content, you know, suggesting these specific backpacking loops or hikes or trails is, you know, talking a lot to like the outdoor shop owners, the fly shops, the guides, you know, even, you know, for when we did our Frisco local trails, I went into the owner of the bookstore who, and just talked to the community about, you know, and they gave us some suggestions like, please don't recommend that trail. Um, you know, that's our, that's our one place that hasn't been found out yet. Or, and so we're able to take those things at least into consideration, um, you know, and then on top of it too, you know, for Vail local trails, you know, certain trailheads couldn't handle the traffic of us putting that into a, a product and suggesting people to go there. And so we're able to take all of that into consideration also, which is, um, which is really, really a pretty unique thing. Okay, cool. So somebody asked about GIS shapefiles. Yeah. I know, I just, Rachel, I, you answer that, I think. Yeah, I answered it. You can just, if you just Google GIS data for roads in Colorado, you're going to get lots of hits. Uh, GIS trails for Canyonlands National Park. You're gonna get there's a layer out there. I just we just revised that map, so that's why I kind of focused on it. And usually every every county has a GIS uh, a yep. data hub now these days, and there's all, everything from like tax areas to to trails in there, and they're all either in shapefile or uh, I guess ArcGIS is using a format called Geo Databases. Um, that yeah, geo databases is a form of a shape file. Um, it's a better way to like maintain all of that data. I think the the cool thing to take home is really this idea of layers started with just printing maps, like an efficient way to print a map. You know, how am I going to print this this hydro layer the most efficiently, cost effective way? And it's to put it on all one layer, all color. So that kind of concept of layers and looking at our surrounding world that way and how it interacts with each other um, is GIS, so. Right. Okay, I think that was all. Um, and I think we're out of time too. So I don't wanna keep anybody too long, it's late. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan and, and Rachel. This was this was awesome. Um, I Great. think you can see from the, from the comments and everybody was really 
very fascinated by what you guys had to share. So thank you so much. If you want to make the slide deck available, I can share it with everybody. And the video has been recorded right now. So we probably going to share that um, in, a, in a week or two once we edit it um, with a YouTube channel. And then I will send out a link to everybody so you uh, can you know, watch it again if you like. Perfect. Is that okay with you guys? That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I know I spit out a lot of information, but. Um, it's okay. I think there were a lot of map nerds on this. Yeah. Webinar, <laughs> so I, I like it. I could talk about this for hours. So. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I wouldn't have I any problem with that. I recommend going to that USGS uh, Topo View site. There's some really cool old maps on there. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, I, I go up, the, I go there a couple of times, uh, almost a month, a couple of times, because you can see like, you know, your area in the 1940s, then in the 1970s, um, mm -hmm. because they have all those USGS maps, so you can actually overlay them and can see how things changed. It's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you can actually download, there's a GeoTIFF too. So if you have the Avenza software, you can add GeoTIFFs of maps to the Avenza mapping software. So you can just find a GeoTIFF or a GeoPDF and load it up to the, to our, to the Avenza map app, which is really useful. All right. <laughs> okay, thanks, guys. Have yeah, a good thanks. night. This is great. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye.